winning your everything. Here are your hosts, Gary and Chris. Welcome in, Winning Cures Everything, number 106. This is the Friday, July 28th edition of the show. I'm Gary. And I'm Chris. We have got another full show today, just like this past Tuesday's show. We're bringing in all first-timers to the program again tonight. we got Jermaine Funny Man Johnson, college football comedian and the star of the How Alabama Fans Watched videos on Facebook. Jason Crowder, the voice of East Mississippi Community College Football and Mississippi State Women's Basketball. And also one of the stars of the Netflix series Last Chance U. And we also welcome in Greg Bishop, senior writer at Sports Illustrated, who we're going to talk to about his latest article, Living Like Tom, One Sports Illustrated Writer Takes on the TB12 Method. And along with that, in our opening segment, we're going to talk about how crazy the 2007 college football season was because it is the 10-year anniversary of that absolutely insane year, which we've all been made aware of thanks to the guys at SB Nation like Spencer Hall, Stephen Godfrey, etc. But first... Let's jump on the rundown of how you can contact us. Check out the website, winningcureseverything.com. You can get us on Facebook. Give us a like over there, facebook.com slash winningcureseverything. You can follow us on Twitter, at winningcures. You can follow myself, at GaryWCE. That's a new one. So, at GaryWCE, I've changed the handle. You can get Chris. Chris B. Giannini, C-H-R-I-S-B-G-I-A-N-N-I-N-I. You can also email the show, winningcureseverything at gmail.com. You can download, subscribe to, and review. That's an important one. Review the podcast. iTunes, Stitcher, TuneIn, SoundCloud, Google Play, all your favorite podcast apps. We're on all of them. But on iTunes, those reviews count. Give us five stars. Write a little sentence about how this is your favorite show. Do it up. You can also get us on Local X Radio localxradio.com or the local x app on your smartphone every tuesday and friday at 9 a.m now today's show is being brought to you as usual by kyle seeger's designs if you need great affordable web design for your company business or just personally check out kyleseegers.com he can handle all of your web development needs including site building maintenance branding and more for more information visit kyle seeger's designs at kyleseegers.com now chris Let's go on and start this thing off with the story of 2007. That was a pretty insane football season. (laughs) Without question, I think the headline says it best on SB Nation. It was the best college football season of all time. All of the different craziness that went down, and it it all culminated with even more craziness. It started out with Appalachian State beating number five, Michigan. Michigan. Which was first game of the college football year. Yeah, you started out with that, and then you've got all kind of different things. It was Tebow's Heisman year, so it was his first year as a starter. Uh, you had just it, all sorts of stuff, right? LSU had the two, three overtime losses. Their big slogan for the year was uh, "We were un- undefeated, undefeated in regulation." regulation. Season. Yeah, Saban's first year at Alabama, they went six and six, lost to Louisiana Monroe. Uh, South Florida made it to number two in the country. Kansas were, were number two in the country. At one Kansas point in time. was, yeah, they were number. Were they ever number one? I, th- I think they were number two. They, they, were they number the two highest when they, they got, got beat by two. Uh, Missouri. I, I mean, it was just Boston College made it to number two. Uh, UAB tried to hire Jimbo Fisher, <laughs> and the Alabama Board of Trustees blocked it because they didn't want Fisher uh, to go and be successful there. The Houston Nut scandal with the Freedom of, uh, of Information Act that well, was hey, bananas. While at Arkansas, uh, what a, a Gundy's uh, rant. I'm was going on that year. I'm a man. Exactly. Didn't have the mullet rocking yet, but but he knew how to exactly. throw it down. The Florida LSU rivalry really hit its stride that year with uh, with Les going for five fourth downs and getting all of them. Getting all of them. Jacob uh, Hester running it like a champ. The same play just about every fourth down. Oh yeah. Stop it. That was the Tebow. Uh, jump pass. That was his first jump pass of his career, which kind of started a thing. Well, I think that was the that was two thousand six. That was oh six because Did that he was do a jump pass in six. Yeah, that was at six was that. he was brought in because Chris Leak was the starter. Yeah, I don't remember him doing the jump pass. No, I just that's, remember him running it in all the time. No, the jump pass was the one that that got him. Okay, like it became a huge thing because that was in the swamp. Like in, in the, the first one? Yeah, in 07, yeah. it was at LSU. It was at LSU. So, I mean, there, there was all sorts of other stuff, right? So, at he had Georgia, a lot of phone calls before that game. Georgia got to 10-2. Navy beat Notre Dame for the first time in like 40 years. Ron Zook beat Ohio State, who was undefeated number one at the time at, at, Illinois. at Illinois. That wasn't why he was at uh, Florida. Now. Howard Schnellenberg won his only other championship at Florida Atlantic, 
besides the uh, what was it the nineteen eighty three Miami the championship Miami championship and and then it took him until two thousand seventeen to win another conference championship, which at Florida Atlantic like yeah. and of course they hammered Memphis in the bowl game that year. Uh, what was that? The New Orleans, New Orleans Bowl, Bowl, I think. Yep. Um, and then, of course, you know, it all ended at the end with uh, Missouri got beat. They were the number one team in the country. They got beat by Oklahoma. And then, on top of that, uh, West Virginia got beat by Pittsburgh. And what was – well, you know, I had I didn't even talk about your boy Harbaugh. No, that's That Jimmy. was Stanford's that's big uh, big stuck upset. stuck in Carroll, baby. Oh, my Lord. That was the biggest betting upset ever. Like the biggest point spread upset because I think USC was what number two in the country. Yeah, bunch of and, smart kids, and they were favored by like forty one. Yeah, I thought it was thirty nine. Something. No, like that. it was four. It was over remember, forty. Okay, I didn't know it was forty. Yeah, I, I thought it was like high. high it 30s. was way up there. Big number. Big. big Don't number. ever bet against Jimmy. Oh my gosh! He's gonna it slap was, you with it. It was bananas. Yeah, yeah, it was just there was a lot that went on in, in two thousand seven. It was nuts. Tell me, right. you you've got a story about the West Virginia. So, Pit game. So I'm a, so I'm a big LSU fan. At this point in time in my life, um, I will I will admit to this. It was the lowest working point in time of my life. Couldn't find work here in Memphis area. I was working in Steubenville, Ohio. Okay, Stu- Steubenville, Ohio is the middle of nowhere, Ohio. That's it's, down next to West Virginia. Isn't it? It's very close to West Virginia. So the the guy that I was staying with is a buddy of mine's dad. He and I were working up there together. And his dad used to take us to this little hole-in-the-wall dive bar, and there's nothing but Ohio State fans and West Virginia fans because we're right across state line from West Virginia. And there was a little secret room in the back. He'd go lay some money down, and I remember that week, as soon as the lines came out, we go up to the bar, walk in, he goes into the back room, puts a big amount, I don't know what it was, on West Virginia, and he come out laughing at me because he knows I'm an LSU guy. And he says, your Tigers blew it. They're not going to make it to the national championship. West Virginia going to beat up on Pitt. Then it's going to be an all Steubenville area national championship. Ohio State versus West Virginia. Everybody up there was pulling for that. Everybody up there was wanting it. So come day of the game, we are at Wheeler, West Virginia. There is a casino there. It's a we- Wheeling <laughs> Island Hotel Casino and Racetrack, something like that. We are watching the game there. I'm sitting in their poker room. All these West Virginia fans are all around me. A few Ohio State fans, mostly West Virginia people there. All eyes are on the TV. The game's not even really going on. Pitt is working them. Pitt is controlling the game. They didn't dominate them, but it was a good game. But It I'm was pretty talking, dominating. 13-7 from, to seven for a team that yeah. – Seven points for a team that normally scores 40-something. Like, you remember jump, Pat White? Yeah. No, Golly, no, he was such a good quarterback. At one point in time, Pat White had more touchdowns than he had – Incompletions. Yeah, like like I thought Pat White could have been the next great thing in, in in pro football early on, but Pitt was holding them. They were beating them up, and everybody was just nervous, 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 nervous. I'm the only guy there cheering for Pitt. Losing my and here's the thing: Steubenville and Wheeling, man, they're only like an hour or two away from Pittsburgh. Like the reason that rivalry is so big is because those those two schools are pretty close. Well, that's why they call Pittsburgh the the Tri River area. Yeah, it's yeah. A, there, it, there's a tri state area right that's there, right. kind of like uh, kind of like here in Memphis right. with Memphis, Memphis and then Arkansas, Arkansas and Mississippi. Mississippi. So, so we're there. They win. It's almost a foregone conclusion that LSU is going to sneak in with their two losses. Um, funny thing, LSU, the only team to win a best uh, in, uh, BCS championship with two losses. Both times they won had two losses. No, no, no. The uh, the Saban year, they only had one. I uh, lost to Arkansas, and they lost the game early. I'm pretty sure they had two losses on both their national championships. I'll double games. check that while you're telling the rest but, of your story. But anyway, I know we lost to Arkansas in both those seasons because I always felt pretty good after we lost to Arkansas. It, it, it that was my saving grace that kept me from getting mad. So I'm all excited. I'm all pumped up. We're now going to have an LSU national championship game, um, and now it's against everybody's beloved Ohio State people. I'm fortunate enough to be able to come home for that. I'm in Memphis hanging out. My brother is a manager at a restaurant here in Memphis, and I'm sitting up there. Got all my LSU gear on. It's kind of a slow night at the bar. There's not a lot of people. It's not really a sports bar, so it, that wasn't that big of a deal. And I'll be damned if the manager on duty didn't know him, never met him before. 
but he is he is from Columbus, Ohio. He walks in with all this Buckeye gear on, and he looks straight at me, and he's like, get out. Get the hell out of my restaurant. <laughs> get out right now. And I'm like, no, man, my brother works here. My brother works here. He's like, your brother don't work here. We ain't got no LSU people that work here. You need to get out. And I was like, no, man, my brother's Barry. You can't throw me out. And he was like, that's your brother? And I was like, yeah, that's my brother. He was like, so he starts calling him. Barry's on his way up there to watch the game with me. To everybody, He's about to throw me out of the bar. The very opening kickoff Ohio State did, does, what exactly what they did the year after that against Florida, run the opening kickoff back. He throws his arms up, and he was like, y'all getting a beat down. After that, they don't score again the rest of the game, yep. and it proceeds to be an, just a, a glorious ass whoop. Oh, yeah. Well, it was like 38 to 24, I think. it was. One you know. of This is when Les became Lesticle. This, this season right here is when oh, yeah. he became the man that he was known for the rest of the season. He was the Mad Hatter. It was that Florida game where he had to keep going for it and keep going for it, and he kept getting it. And every time he'd roll the dice, every time he would go against what what is the the statistical norm, the the situation, he didn't care. It just always came up his way, and and it's, I, I know that it's you know LSU won the national championship that last year, so that year, so it, it's you know it's easy for me to say that that was that was it, but. I mean, oh, all yeah. the things that had to happen for LSU to get in there. They lost to Arkansas in regulation, and they lost to or in, in overtime, and they lost to Kentucky. And both Bobo, of them in triple yeah, overtime. And, yeah, and both so, on the road. Uh, your, your 2003 Tigers yeah. went 13-1. and one. They okay. lost to Florida in Tiger Stadium. I thought we lost to Arkansas. Nope, beat Arkansas 55-24. to 24. Okay, so that was an ass whooping. Yeah, and that was in Tiger Stadium. So, yeah, I mean, it's... It, Yes, I'm with you. This that was how Les became the Mad Hatter. That's it. That was that was the season that it went down. Everyone was saying at the SEC championship game that he was going to Michigan. It was a foregone conclusion. He was out of there. Les had to have a press conference before that game to let everybody know I'm here. I'm not leaving. Yep, I'm staying I'm going right here. Nowhere. This it is was, my home. Michigan was my home for a long time. Now this is my home. Oh yeah. And then they had to beat Tennessee, who was pretty good at no, nine and three. Was good, man. And I mean, people people don't even think about how they ended up winning that game. LSU intercepted a pass and returned it for a touchdown with like nine minutes left when they were down fourteen to thirteen. But they they had Ryan Paraloo starting that game as a backup quarterback. I mean, yeah. they, the whole thing was just well. Matt Flynn was a regular starter. Oh hurt. man, yeah. I mean, LSU they've never won. With, with a great quarterback. Well, no. In my lifetime, in my day and age, I don't know that they've ever had a great quarterback. What about Rohan Davey, man? Come on now. <laughs> Come on now. They've never had a great quarterback. Oh, Lord. But it was an awesome season. It, it was. was. It was it a really fun was. year. And when you look back at this story, man, I didn't realize it had been 10 years. You look back at this story, dude, that was that was oh, a yeah. great college football season. I mean, season. everything came out of that, right? Uh, just everything happened that what year. What about – what about Kansas and Missouri? Oh, my gosh. Kansas going 12 and 1. Powers, and then, I mean, what happened? Oh, Lord. I, I can't even – I don't know. I can't even begin to to think about it. Notre Dame, Nebraska, and Miami all went 3 and 9 that year. Yep. Uh, you know, Tennessee Charlie, was Charlie actually White good again. Charlie money, stole more money from, from – that's, that's when he first began to steal money from college sports. This was the year before um, – oh, gracious. This was the year before – Phil Fulmer got fired. Mm -hmm. That's right. And, it, and they figured out quickly that it was David Cutcliffe that was running the show. Every time Cutcliffe came back, they were good. Every time he left, they were horrible. Mm -hmm. So, man, it's it's some nut stuff. All right, we're, we're going to jump off that. Next up, uh, we're going to bring in Jermaine Funny Man Johnson. I cannot wait for this one. Coming up next on Winning Cures Everything on Local X. This is Gary Seegers from Winning Cures Everything, and I know you're looking for new gear for college football season. If that's the case, check out the new online store at winningcureseverything.com. We've got new WCE shirts in all sizes with all your favorite SEC colors. Just click on the store tab at winningcureseverything.com. Welcome back to Winning Cures Everything with Gary and Chris. Right now we want to welcome to the show the one and only Funny Man. You can follow him Yo. on Twitter. Yeah, what up, man? <laughs> ain't nothing, ain't nothing. There you go. You can follow him on Twitter. At Funny Man, that's funny, M-A-I-N-E. You can also find him at FunnyMan.com. My friend, welcome to Winning Cures Everything, and thank you for coming on the show. 
Thank you so much for having me, man. Uh, just ripping and running. Been looking forward to this interview, though. Oh, absolutely. All right, now, it, it, let's start off with this. Everybody that follows SEC football on social media has seen one of your videos. Where where did that <laughs> idea come from? Where did How Alabama Fans Watched videos come from? You know, man, it, I'll be honest, it was a spur-of-the-moment thing. I was in Nashville week one, and all I had – in that hotel was my iPhone and a couch. So I just figured I'd record myself reacting to the videos to see if I could relate. And boy, oh boy, could they. Oh, it took off like crazy. Now, I'll be real with you yes, right sir. now. My co-host is an LSU fan. <laughs> and he was very hesitant to the idea of having you come on. I'm, I'm going to let him ask you this next question. All right. So we'll start right. We'll start it off with this. I, I, I think I know the answer. I hope I'm wrong. But – what fan base gives you the most crap online, and how do they go about it? And is anyone actually seriously like dislike you, or or is it mostly fun and games? Uh, let, let me let me go backwards. No one that I've met has seriously like disliked me. Okay, but the fan <laughs> the fan base that gives it to me, the fan bases that give me the most, it is not Tennessee, it's not Auburn, it's not LSU for whatever reason. It is freaking Florida fans. What? Florida fans. I don't. I don't know what it's about, but it's Why been all season. I don't know. I but, do not know. And then, of course, Clemson fans kind of came came along. Oh Lord, yeah. They're just, they're just riding the wave, yeah. man. Yeah, the hell, the hell with the, those guys. The Florida man. The Florida fans. They not. All of them, but the ones that get in my mentions and come, they say the nastiest stuff, like the meanest, mean, most mean spirited <laughs> stuff. And I just like, wow, what, what did we do to Florida? All right. I, I, I'm a little disappointed. I'm going to have to get my LSU buddies to step up the game. That, that, that's bad, man. <laughs> I thought it was surely well, going to be Auburn. You know what it is though? The LSU people that follow me, they know I'm a big Saints fan. Oh, okay. So, so I we guess can, there's some common ground there. That's there right. Go. We can we can have some friends there. That's okay. Right, so, right, 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 right. All right. You kinda of do something a little different than most people. You step out on a limb and you say, I'm a Bama fan and I'm I'm mm -hmm. I'm a comedian and I'm I'm rooting my team, I'm repping my team. By doing that, you kind of shut out a lot of other fan bases, might piss some people off who, who you know, I'm not going to root for or cheer for or go see an Alabama guy. Is that strange for you? <laughs> Have you felt any, like, any of your shows, does that, like, I guess affect you in any way in how you sell out no, shows? No, it's, it's honestly, it's been the exact opposite of, of what you said, and this is the reasoning. I, I used to wonder, like, I did – Show it. We sold out Nashville, and a bunch of Tennessee and Vandy fans come. <laughs> Every show, there's always different fan bases, and there's different fan bases that follow, but it's the relatability. So, okay. number one, I asked them, I said, well, what do y'all like? Because I'm not even talking about – it's like, dude, we act just like that for our team. <laughs> and, then, and then the other thing that they tell me is when they win, they want their shout-out. Like, oh, yeah. okay, we won, so Funny well, Man has to shout us out in this week's video. So <laughs> there's a common thing, and then there's the spiritual element. You know, I'm always positive, and I am a Christian, and a lot of them, you know, they they tend to like that. And well, they can there's respect a lot of common ground. It. Yeah, that's right, right, right. right. There, there's right. a lot of common ground. That makes a whole lot of sense. All right, now you've been selling out shows all over the Southeast. Uh, you were involved with Heart in the City when it rolled through Birmingham. What was that right. like, and, and how has it helped you out? Man, that was the perfect storm. We filmed that thing in March of 2016, and I was booked to perform at the Stardome in uh, November, like the week leading up to the Iron Bowl, and they told us that they were going to air the episode November 20th. Oh, so Lord. that's March, April, May, June, July, August, September, October, November, Eight months later, you know, they air it the week that I'm and, – and soon as it aired, people stopped looking at me as just the guy on the couch, and they said, oh, he's with Kevin Hart. He's a real comedian. <laughs> and we went from zero tickets sold to four show, sold-out shows at the start of after the heart of the city. So that was That's awesome. perfect. That's awesome. Well, we'll get you out here on this. I know it's short. you got to run. Let me hear what your thoughts are on the SEC this year. I'm sure Bama's on top. Who you like in the East? 
And can anybody beat Bama? You know, they're going to go twelve and zero again through the regular season. Where might they slip up? I like, I do like Georgia in the East. I like Georgia a lot. Uh, I think Tennessee is going to. I think Tennessee is going to have a down year for losing that great quarterback. And I think that Florida will probably. It'll it'll be a two way race between Florida and Georgia. So Jacksonville will probably solve all of that. But Bandy <laughs> and Kentucky. They're going to have something to say about who goes to Atlanta. Trust Spoilers. me, write that down. Bandy and Kentucky will have something to say about the SEC. Like hey, what, what do you think about Coach O at LSU? Oh, Coach Ogero. I like <laughs> Ogero. I, I, I follow him, man. I remember when he was the coach at Ole Miss, and then he, had, uh, he went in limbo for a few years out at SC. I always liked him. He, you know, he's a player's coach. Uh, great he keeps recruiter. it real. Yeah. He's a real right, likable right, guy. Right. He really he was, is. Yeah, and he was out there working with Kiffin for a minute. And, you know, I just, I just always like Coach Joe. He's a, he's a likable guy. That's right. Funny guy. He's coming for you this year, though. Oh, you crazy. Yeah. You crazy. <laughs> <We'll see. laughs> this dude's, this dude's we'll bananas. See. All right, last one. Over, under on Alabama and Vegas is 10 and a half wins. You going over, under? Oh man, how many how many games we play? Twelve. Twelve games. <laughs> I'm gonna go over. I'm gonna go over. <laughs> we, I love it. People, I I think we may have a slip up. I don't know where to come, and I know people listen like, why would you say that, dude? We haven't had an undefeated full season since 2009. Oh, yeah. We've had a slip up in every season since then. So I think it'll happen. When who knows? But you know, it'll it'll probably happen. I love it. All right. That is Funny Man. Check him out online at funnymain.com or on Twitter at Funny Man. Man, we really appreciate you coming on with us tonight. We are, uh, we're looking forward to having you on again sometime soon this football season. And we got to get you up to Memphis for sure. That's right. Oh, yeah. I was just up in Memphis. Well, in the Tunica area. Yeah, you were in Tunica. And Memphis. Yeah, I do. <laughs> Memphis is like my, that's my second city right there. I love Memphis. There you East go. Grizz fan. We'll have to catch I up love with you. me some Memphis. Oh, I love it. Yeah, we, we're going to get you back up here real soon. we got to get you on to make some picks this football season. That, that sounds good to me. Let's do it. Thank that, you, sir. That we works. appreciate your time. All right, man. Roll tide. <laughs> Roll tide, buddy. <laughs> yeah. This is Gary Seegers, your co-host and owner of Winning Cures Everything, the best sports blog and podcast in the South. There are a ton of ways that you can connect with us. First, check out the website, winningcureseverything.com. Second, give us a like on Facebook, facebook.com slash winningcureseverything. Third, follow us on Twitter, at winningcures, or myself, at ProSevereGary, or at Chris B. Giannini. Four, email the show, winningcureseverything at gmail.com. Fifth, download, subscribe to, and review the podcast. You can find us on iTunes, Stitcher, TuneIn, SoundCloud, Google Play, and all of your favorite podcast apps. We'll have new shows up every Tuesday and Friday morning along with different articles throughout the week. Remember, winningcureseverything.com. Welcome back to Winning Cures Everything with Gary and Chris. If you were a fan of the show Last Chance You on Netflix, then you've seen our next guest before. You can follow him on Twitter, at CrowderJason. He is the voice of the football team at East Mississippi Community College, Jason Crowder. Jason, we appreciate you joining us. Hey, guys. First of all, I'm honored to be on the program because as I was telling somebody earlier today, when my face pops up on the screen, it's that field time, <laughs> in between time when you see Buddy throwing a temper tantrum, or Miss Wagner working with the guys, or maybe a football game. And so I'm that point of the of the broadcast where they get up and go into the kitchen to get snacks. And so <laughs> some people listening right now go, "Who is Jason Crowder?" So um, I'm the annoying voice you hear a lot calling football games in that. Uh, in that documentary, but it's an honor to be on with you guys. Absolutely, I, our buddy Ben Price was on the show with us last week and, and said that we got to get you on the show to talk football. You know, we're <laughs> we're actually planning on coming down to uh, Cenotopia in October for the uh, the EMCC Northwest game. So hopefully, we'll end up yeah. running into you down there. Yeah, I, please do come come uh, come see me and, and we'll uh, as my old boss used to say, treat you so many good ways, can't help but like one of them. I'll say this <laughs> about Ben Price: he is excellent. I miss Ben; he used to be in the booth with us. He would spot for me. So when I would screw up, it was Ben's fault. And so uh, <laughs> That's always I, mean, a good I thing. miss Ben. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> now, I, I'm not all the way through the show just yet. 
but but from the very first episode, this season feels way more stressful just right off the bat. At, could you tell from the atmosphere around the program, even early last season, that there were going to be changes heading into this year? Yeah, I, Buddy and I had a long, long uh, talk uh, about a year ago right now. And it was right after the show came out. And Buddy, uh, of course, saw the screening of the show in April. So Buddy, you know, started self-reevaluating a lot before anybody saw the show. Um of course, was convicted, uh, came to know the Lord during the summer. Now, I know some people that are going to be listening to this interview are going to roll their eyes and say, well, that didn't look like a Christian to me, and I can understand that. Uh, but he struggled at, at points in the season, and especially towards the end of the season. But he had a spiritual advisor that would try to keep him in check. And I told Buddy a year ago to this week, change is going to be hard for you. Well, especially because for a football coach. For I mean, a football coach. That, 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 that's where I'm getting at. Yeah. It's not like, oh, buddy, God can't change you because, yes, he can. But we have to allow God to change us. And we have what we call old sin nature. I'm a Christian. So, you know, I, I go by those things every day of I'm not perfect. I'm going to fail. And I have to lean on God for his forgiveness and grace. So this is what I told buddy. I said, buddy, it's going to be hard for you to change because – you're a football coach and a pressure cooker with you got to win, win, win. And believe it or not, some people think it's real easy for East Mississippi to win. Oh, Lord, in no. some ways, <laughs> in some ways, yes, I understand when you're up 54 nothing on a good team, when you beat a number one, a number two team in the country a couple of years ago in Northwest by three or four touchdowns, I, I get where people think that. But Buddy is under a lot of stress and pressure because the JUCO system in Mississippi, although it may look like it's way below East Mississippi, it's still, they can beat you. And you, can't, you can't, it's like what my buddy Big Schaefer says at Mississippi State, also called women's basketball at MSU. Mm-hmm. Big Schaefer says, if you don't go out and prepare to play an SEC basketball game, not only are you, if you go out and you lose, you're not only going to lose, you're going to get embarrassed. Because you can go out and prepare as hard as you can and still lose. So it's kind of the same way. And at East Mississippi, they've gone through fluxes where they've had really talented players that mess really well, and then they've gone to where they had really talented players that don't mess very well. And in all honesty, I don't think the players meshed very well this past season. I don't think they were a team that was united like 2013 and 2014 that just literally annihilated everybody they played. Now, were they good enough to win? Yes. Um, and in all honesty, EMCC probably should have hoisted a national championship trophy at the end of the season. Um, they were that good compared to the rest of the field. The, the, the teams that played for it, EMCC was two or three touchdowns better. So, yeah, you could tell there was a little bit of stress because of the documentary and how people perceived East Mississippi Community College. Now, was the documentary popular? Yes, absolutely popular. People loved it. But there were also some areas where people didn't like, and, and that was Buddy Stevens <laughs> and some of his antics, and especially the way the brawl. And see, the brawl came out, and also not only the brawl, but you've got to deal with still paying the penance first game of the season. Exactly. And we knew that that was going to linger on. And this, will, when kickoff happens August 31st against Jones and Scuba, this will be the first time that literally the brawl is behind East Mississippi Community College. I, I made a comment on the broadcast. Last year, I think they used it on the documentary where I said now that, you know, the brawl, the, the, all that's behind you. No, it still carried over for the rest of the season because you were 0-1 going into game two. And it, people expect to win in scuba. Yeah, I, it, it, a losing record they, does not go over well. Buddy Stevens has told me this. Fans sometimes aren't showing up at those games to see you win. They're anticipating you failing because they're used to winning – and so I've, I've heard – I'm high up in the press box, but I've heard grumbling from fans when you come out of the locker room in the third quarter, you're up, you know, three touchdowns, all of a sudden the team keeps fighting, maybe you're laxing a bit, and then all of a sudden, you know, the walls are just coming down for the fans. And EMCC, you know, is probably going to end up winning the game. But, but if you don't win by enough, it's – yeah. It makes right. sense. It, it's Alabama uh, at a smaller level. That actually plays into the next well, question. Yeah, that, that, that brings us yeah. into the next question. Coach Stevens says his 2017 team is going to be the fastest he's ever had in the school. 
Now, he's had some good teams in the past. Do high expectations uh, sometimes weigh on the team, or has the team been so good for so long that it doesn't really change anything? You know, that's a great question, and I haven't heard Buddy say that. Uh, we, we've had some conversations. That, honestly, I haven't even really asked him much about the 2017 team. All we really know is some of the guys that are coming back, and then, of course, your signees that, of course, they're going to have a good signing class every year. But I think it's starting to get to the latter. I, I don't think – yeah, Buddy Stevens is under pressure to win. But I think with the program and the rest of the players, I think you just expect to win. And it's a lot like Alabama. It is the Alabama right now, the JUCO football system, in the fact that you go out there and you expect EMCC to win every single football game. It may be by 54 which has been the case in some cases, maybe even over 60 <laughs> points, or it may be just by three. But you expect the MCC to find a way to win the football game. And unfortunately, there's some really entertaining games that EMCC has been a part of. Now, we as broadcasters love that. Oh, yeah. Even though I want EMCC to win, I'm their radio announcer, I'm a homer. But at the same time, I don't want to be calling a 54 nothing football game in the second quarter and try to keep an audience engaged for two more quarters. Come out of the locker room because then we're not on our toes as broadcasters. <laughs> we try to fall asleep. And, oh, you yeah. know, people probably tune in and off, so you probably don't even have an audience. So those games are tough, too. You want to win, but you don't want to go out and just, you know, win 90-7, to 7, you know, like I had to call it. I had to call that game one time when the MCC won a homecoming <laughs> game against Oklahoma, 90-7. to 7. And, guys, I think it was Oklahoma. Oklahoma or Delta. It was one of the Delta schools. Yeah. And I remember, yeah. I, I remember being really excited – in the first quarter. And it was just like, you know, touchdown, <laughs> EMCC. That's a 40-yard strike from Wyatt Roberts to whatever, or Don Trump, or whoever played at the time. And then all of a sudden you get to the second quarter where it's like, you know, Preston Baker, the touchdown maker with a five-yard run. You know, and then you're just And it's like, like every you know, other play, right? Every That's... other, you're right. And then so you're just yawning. You know, touchdown, EMCC, that'll make it 74 to nothing. You know? <laughs> and you're going, gosh, clock, clock, please run. And Buddy doesn't like the buddy rule, quote unquote. He That's exactly what I was going to bring up because it, he I it. did he not turn down he well obviously you would like it but like but well, it, didn't he take like he took a knee on a two point conversion at one point right to, so that the oh clock God, wouldn't start God, running he did he did that made awkward that made us awkward <laughs> to finish one point on that though I did get excited in the fourth quarter which some people call it the jerk for in a way because I got all excited when they scored their ninetieth point because I was being told by sports information people, hey, this is going to be a record, you know. So then it's like, touchdown, AMCC, and everybody's like, oh, <laughs> this game may be interesting. They're, you know, they're fumbling through the score, and all of a sudden it's like, it's 90-7 to 7 pinning the PAT. <laughs> and you're like, oh, that guy's a turd. So, you know, <laughs> it puts us in bad situations sometimes. But oh, yeah, yeah, Buddy hates the rule because he wants to get reps for guys. He wants to get the stats. He is adamant that he says, Jason, if the clock runs, I don't get guys like – you remember Preston Baker? Yeah. Preston yeah. Baker could play anywhere in the country. I think. I think he was an SEC caliber player. Some people may disagree with that, but, I mean, he was a bruiser yet fast. I thought he could do it. Now, Preston Baker ended up going to what? Um, um, oh, gosh, uh, Tennessee Tech or somewhere like that in Tennessee. Yeah, Division, school. Division II school. Yep. Division II school. When – because he just didn't have enough film. He didn't have – which I find that hard to believe sometimes, but Buddy says he didn't have the stats. I shouldn't say film. Let me take that back. That's guys like Isaiah Wright, Aron Lolly that didn't play in certain games. Yeah. They didn't have enough film. Now, but you get a Preston Baker who didn't get enough reps because they didn't see enough stats from him that made them believe that he – I'm like, I asked Buddy one time. I said, these college coaches are not idiots. Can't they look at film? But can't they look at, okay, well, there's a running clock. This guy didn't get to that. Can't they see those things? And he said, it just is It is what it is. Dave. Well, then they so, want to know why he like wasn't it. playing more. You know, then it becomes well, something interesting. True, so well, I, and here's the EMCC so deep every year running back. Exactly. You look at what they had last year. Isaiah Wright was upset about not being able to play. Well, he should have been. Well, he was wrong because he had the concussion. But I can get his anxiety because you had a Jacquez Horsley. You had a Tyrell Price. You know, you had guys like that. And then, they, then there was the fourth guy from Calvin City who was a freshman. 
his name escapes me. He didn't get enough reps, but he played some. He wore number 20. He was a guy that fumbled in the, the uh, game against um, a Jones to start the season. Fumbled into the end zone, and EMCC could have taken a lead. So, you know, they had depth at running back. So it's like, okay, you got a concussion or your ankle's twisted, you know, whatever. We can plug this guy in. So that's part of the problem, too. EMCC is so deep at certain positions, and it's hard to get touches, especially running back position. Well, so last year was the second year that last chance you was on campus. It appears often that Coach Stevens is tired of dealing with the cameras always being around. Although his team won every game but the first one last year, it just seemed like people felt like the cameras were a distraction or, and, and they were just ready to be done with it. Could could there be some positive from not having the cameras around this season? Has Netflix talked about coming back next year? Um, it's official. Netflix will not be back. I knew back in June okay. that they would not be back. I just couldn't say it. Um, they're going to a school in Kansas, and it came out today. I actually tweeted um, Scott Walters, who's our statistician for the EMCC radio broadcast, he works for the Commercial Dispatch and is the beat writer for the Lions, for that paper. Um, he, I think it's, ind- it's independent or independence. I, 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 it's, I'm driving down the road think, trying to – my 39-year-old brain sometimes operates like an 89-year-old <laughs> brain, and so I have not had my caffeine in a while. But I don't have any notes in front of me. But they, they will not be back on the campus of uh, EMCC. And, and uh, one of the crew members who will remain anonymous um, did send me a text instead. Part of the reason was Buddy became too hard to deal with. So I think that makes that a lot of kind sense. Kind of became it, it. Kind of became a little bit of a. I don't want to say a prop. Now I'm good. Now, as much as I love the Netflix crew, Greg Whiteley and our friends. Greg Whiteley is great. Again, I were texting back and forth this morning, complimenting each other on great work. Um, and none of this has anything to do with Greg, but then again, he's the producer. He's responsible. I think, so, like, all right, you remember the scene, I think it was in the ICC game, when Buddy comes in the locker room and he's highly upset. We know he can get like that. Oh, yeah, blood yeah, I know what you're talking about. Or something. Yeah, yeah, blood sugar probably dropped or something. You know, he, he told me, you know, his diabetes, <laughs> and I'm not making fun. He really said that one time. That, that caused him some of his honor. Orner, you know, being ornery. Yeah. So he t- kicks the, tries to kick the, the cameraman out. Get out, get out. Then he's like, just move at least. Yeah. C- come over here. He's like, like don't just don't get, get in between me and a player. Yeah. Like I've asked you to over and over. So I think there was some times where Buddy may have said, don't do this, but maybe the camera. And guys, I'll be honest with you, I was not around during the week. Yeah. I was not around during some of those conversations that Buddy had with Netflix. All I know is what. He said, she said, but he said, and then maybe a crew member said. Um, but there's no doubt he probably did tell him. But now at the same time, Buddy should they shouldn't have kicked him out of the training room one time either. Because if you're going to grant, and Buddy didn't do that, it was the other coaches. It, I, I, at least my memory thinks it's other coaches, but was in there. But <laughs> you, you can't, it's safe to say Buddy could come out. Yeah. But you can't cram them all access and then say, okay, get out of my way. So I've gone a long way around this. No, they will not be on campus. Uh, I think there can be positives and neg- negatives of that. I think the negatives are the school is going to miss out once again on merchandise sales for a year from now. Yeah. They're going to maybe miss out on some of that exposure. Um, so you need to be taking opportunities now, marketing, and they do as best they can being at a junior college level, which I've always said this, EMCC operates at a D1 level. Because oh, yeah. if you've seen their stadium, their game day operations, Jenny Cody does a great job down there with the bookstore and also game day operations. They run a video board. They have set the standard for JUCO football in Mississippi. Now other places are getting video boards. The MCC was first. And so they started operating like there are many Mississippi State or Ole Miss. And that's great because it gives these players an environment of, hey, this is what it's like on steroids, though, when you go to a Mississippi State or Ole Miss. So you get a little bit of a taste of that. So those are the negatives. I think the positives will be with Buddy. And I think the positives will be with this program getting that distraction out because I think year one it wasn't as much of a distraction. Year two it was more of a distraction because guess what? The players saw themselves on TV. Oh, yeah. Um, maybe a little bit more drama is going to be drawn out more than it should be. Does Isaiah Wright really go nuts if a camera is kind of not in his face? Yeah, maybe a little bit. But I think – Maybe does Buddy overreact in some cases more? Maybe deep down these guys are like, "Hey, there's a camera there. Let's 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 put a good show on." I mean, oh, yeah. I don't know. I, it, but I think this year was more 
as you alluded to earlier, it seemed like there's a little more, everybody's a little more tense. It didn't seem like the coaches ever was relaxed. Now, was that Netflix's fault? I don't know. Or was it the brawl? Maybe everybody's still upset over the brawl. I think it might have been a the combination. Brawl, I think it could have been a combination. I think the brawl, I don't want to say setting MCC. It did set the MCC back because I think you're looking at back to back national champions. You're looking at back to back to back to back. I think four times. Yeah. What do you call that that. row? Quadruple, whatever. So it did set EMCC back. But what all it did was set them back a loss, but it did cost them two national championships, so they're still winning. But they don't get a lot of respect by pollsters either. I find some of the JUCO system a joke as far as trying to figure out who the best team is in college football, in national junior college football. So how do you solve that? You don't because you can't go to a playoff. I don't think they go to a playoff system. I just don't think that's going to work. No, I don't think so. But because this, the money's not there. Uh, some would say, well, wouldn't it create money? I mean, it's, if you could do it without it costing you. Like, well, I just don't think they're – do they care enough? That's the question. Does the NJCAA care enough? And I think, too, there's a little bit of a bias towards the – for example, you look at Alabama. Everybody says there's a bias towards Alabama because they're good. So Alabama's going to be up there no matter what. East Mississippi, the more they win, it seems like more like the pollsters, everybody rolls their eyes and hates them and tries to do what they can to keep them out. Oh, yeah. I it's, really they, honestly they almost, believe that, guys. Oh, they, they almost want them to uh, – they, hey. they want to look for some – oh, well, they should have beaten this team by 70, but they only beat them by 50. You know. But not only that, guys, I think it just goes back to – it starts with Mac JC because we're not very popular in the Mac JC. Yeah. That's just, that's just a fact. Um, and the Mac JC doesn't do anything to help EMCC nationally. Uh, we know Southward, uh, Jim Southward has had an ongoing feud with Buddy Stevens and some people at EMCC. And do I fault Jim Southward for being embarrassed over the brawl? Absolutely not. But sometimes I think maybe there could be a little bit too, I don't want to say harsh of a penalty. It's kind of hard because I see EMCC's pleas and yet. I see Mac JC. It's kind of like you would think the Mac JC would want, regardless of the brawl, because this happened the year before, you're, you're sweating trying to get into that top two spots. You would think that the Mac JC would want EMCC to do well because they're your really only hope to win a national championship. Some would say, well, wait a minute, Northwest won it. Yeah, I understand that. It, yeah, and it's I a know different. people get tired of the asterisk talk. I, I understand Northwest doesn't like Buddy Stevens being arrogant and saying, well, I'll put an asterisk by it. But, guys, here's the, the the whole honest truth on it. Buddy's right. Were they a good football team? Absolutely, Northwest a good football team. Did they deserve the national championship? I, yeah, because East Mississippi was disqualified. So, really, EMCC has nobody to blame but themselves, the football team. But at the same time, it's true. If EMCC were allowed to participate, oh, they <laughs> and if wiped the ball the doesn't happen, yeah. wipe the floor with Northwest because they can't hang. So... I, and I say that though, Northwest fought tooth the nail in that game that year, and all and almost came away with a win. Or was it the past year? Uh, maybe, I think it was this past year where yeah. um, Gardner Minshew and them, you know, did a really really good job. So, um, and and I can't remember the back's name. It was really really good. Um, but I tell you, it's just it just seems like there's EMCC's hated so much. And I'm not saying Alabama's the most loved program. I think other <laughs> schools want to see Alabama go down and we're Absolutely. excited to Clemson beat them. Yeah. Even teams in the SEC that say family, 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 I think they were like <laughs> snickering, you know. Oh, yeah. yeah well, there was all. no family. And, but but at the same time, I, I, I just feel like it's as far as pollsters, the media, because EMCC has been, I mean, it started a couple of years ago when EMCC was just blowing people out. I mean, even Scott – well, Scott Walters didn't write the article, but the commercial dispatch out of Columbus, Mississippi, had an opinion columnist that blasted Buddy and blasted EMCC. And I'm like, hold on a minute. That's that's your school that you cover. You know, I, I just – I thought that was a, a mistake article. And, it, it, you know, and then, of course, that's when I started to see Buddy start getting very defensive. And Buddy became defensive then and has still been defensive now about his program and how he operates it. And in ways I understand that. I get it. But sometimes Buddy needs to pick his battles. And that's, you know, the advice that I would have for him if he asks it. Now, I'm not going to call Buddy right now and say, Buddy, I just watched 
Last Chance You. You know I love you, right? We're close friends, right? Yeah, yeah, man, that's for you. <laughs> well, you need to pick your battles. Have a good night. You know, no. But if and, and when Buddy and I talk again soon, which will be soon, you know, if he wants to bring it up, what you think? And they say, hey, buddy, this is it. let's pick our battles. And I think he would agree with that. Now, is he going to go and do it? That's Yeah, that's we'll, we'll have to see. We will have to but see. I'm a Buddy Stevens defender, and sometimes it gets me in trouble. And and I, but I just have to say, look, he's my friend. Um, he believes in me in radio. Um, I'm still there today because of the good Lord and Buddy, and the administration still like me. And I have Buddy's support, and so I'm going to support Buddy. And he knows that everything he does is not right. He and I have talked about that. I told him last year, you can't live in the past. You know, what you can do right now is go towards the future. And no matter how much Buddy may change in the future, people are still going to be have an attitude towards him. And that's where he's going to have to learn how to pick his battles some, too, maybe with some of his peers in coaching. But that all started well before the Netflix cameras ever came on campus. Oh, I so, can imagine. Uh, I yeah. can imagine. Uh, but he's not, you know, he had, I remember one time I was, before I became the play-by-play guy, and it was in 2008, I did sideline one game. And we played over in West Point, and it was a game that they would do annually in West Point. Right? They don't do that anymore because no fits in West Point <laughs> Stadium. There's a great stadium down in school in Mississippi. Of course, Scoob at that time didn't have a great stadium. It was terrible, uh, to be exact. So I'm standing down there, and Buddy is just livid on an official or somebody, maybe a player. I can't really remember, but I remember standing around the 20-yard line uh, at the end of the first down marker, uh, at the end of the chains, and I look over at the guy next to me, and I just said, God, I love Buddy Stevens. And the official that was standing there turns around, just turns his head, and he turns his body, turns his head and says, uh, sometimes. And then started running out on the field. For, and I was like, oh, okay. So, buddy, this goes way back to 2008. I mean, you heard last year what Dr. Eidner said, and Dr. Young said, hey, I think it was Dr. Young because he's the one that hired him. He's like, you know, we wanted to change some things around here. And Buddy Stevens said, if you want to win, hire me. Yeah. And it goes back to what I said on the documentary. Buddy has that swagger that all coaches have to have if you want to be successful. It has to be controlled, and sometimes Buddy doesn't control it, but – um, I don't even know what got us on all this. I, I think I'm just rambling. I'm a radio guy. Y'all forget. But uh, I, I think the show um, being gone will have some positives uh, and, and some negatives, but I think the positives may outweigh the negatives. I, I, I would love to see them back because I don't think the story's fully told. But with Brittany Wagner gone, Marcus Wood gone now, you're losing some of your characters. And then, of course, football players are going to be all new characters. Oh, yeah. Because everybody they feature won't be back. So it's not like people are sitting back and, and there was only one that returned last year and I was like right and he really wasn't even a character so you're going to have new characters every year in Juco football but I, I don't think the EMCC story is completed and um, I, I would love to see them stick with EMCC to win a national championship for some sort of redemption because in all honesty guys even though they won every game that, after they lost that one and, and we're state champions redemption's not there until you go out and you win that national championship again because that's what you lost in the brawl Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. All right. He is Jason Crowder, voice of the East Mississippi Lions, Mississippi State women's basketball, and uh, a star of Last Chance You on Netflix. You can follow him on Twitter, at Crowder Jason. Jason, thank you so much for being here. You have been fantastic. We are definitely going to be hey, talking to you again during the season. Please do. Uh, I would love to jump on and uh, and talk with you guys. Y'all are fun to talk to. Y'all sound like y'all do a great job. I haven't heard your show, but the interviews has been great, and uh, it's been comfortable. I haven't had to answer anything that's been – you know, you, you didn't ask me anything very uncomfortable. But yeah, I've nothing too invasive. Person. <laughs> right. I've had, we'll, we'll I we'll not believe time. some of the questions. Oh, absolutely. You know, <laughs> um, I'm not going to, I'll tell you guys off the air, but I'm not going to ask, you know, you know, I'm not going to tell you what I'm asked on the air. It's just inappropriate. So. <laughs> well, good and deal. I'm like, I don't know, but I doubt it. <laughs> I feel you. you know, I feel so. you. Well, good oh, deal. Well, let us like, let us jump out of here right now. We are we're late sure. for another interview, so let, let me oh, get now. You're all good. Let me oh, jump out, great, but man. I will uh, I will be hitting you back up, my friend. Thanks, man. All right, God bless, guys. We'll talk with you down the road. Absolutely. Yes, Take care. This is Gary, host of Winning Cures Everything. If you're looking for affordable custom web design, business cards, brochures, and more, check out Kyle Seegers Designs at kyleseegers.com. Kyle offers full website design, monthly site maintenance and content management system training. Remember, for all your web design needs, check out kyleseegers.com. That's K-Y-L-E-S-E-G-A-R-S.com.
Our next guest is a senior writer for Sports Illustrated. Just put out an article about my favorite topic titled Living Like Tom. One, <clears throat> one Sports Illustrated writer takes on the TB12 method over at SI.com. You can follow him on Twitter at Greg Bishop SI. Welcome, Greg Bishop, to the show. Thanks for coming on with us. No, I appreciate you guys having me. So I've always loved Tom. I've been a Patriots fan since way before it was cool to be one and when they weren't real good back in the day. So uh, I feel like my passion for him has grown as a follower and believer of Tom uh, as I've learned about the sacrifices that he makes to be as great as he is. And, you know, I used to always have this saying that, you know, the reason why I'm not great at anything is because I've never had great sacrifice. I think to be great takes great sacrifice. He embodies that, and you went through the TB12 challenge. I just read about it the other day, went through the article, great article. My question for you is this. Why did you originally take this challenge on? Are you a fellow Tom worshiper? Are you intrigued by his career and how he's been able to do it that long, or are you just a skeptic and wanted to see firsthand what's this about? No, that's a great question. You know, uh, I wrote a piece about Brady for the magazine back in 2014, and it was the first time he'd really talked about all the stuff he was doing with Alex Guerrero. Uh, which he was talking about how he ate the avocado ice cream uh, and how he planned to schedule three years in advance and how, you know, all these things sort of came together for him to be able to play better when he was older. And so I've written about that a couple different times, uh, you know, over the course of the years, and I thought that it would be interesting uh, this summer to really try it out, try to understand it, and see if uh, if I could pull it off and if, if uh, it was as beneficial as he said. And so that was really the intention going in. Uh, I've written a lot about him, not not a Patriots fan per se, but uh, just curious at how a guy can win a Super Bowl at 39 and play the way that he has. And so really wanted to dive into that. All right, now, I'd, Gary here, by the way. Uh I noticed you said in the article that Brady mostly abstains from sugar, he eats no dairy, carbs are a no-no, uh, and they said no coffee, which would kill me. I've, I've tried the ketogenic diet thing, uh, but a lot of my snacks are cheese sticks, and I put cheese on everything. I eat burgers without a bun. Uh, the no coffee thing is ridiculous because I live on coffee in the mornings. If you were not writing an article and you just had to live like this every day, how long do you think you'd last before you had to eat something on their no-no list? <laughs> That's a great question. I think it would be pretty hard to live as, as strict as they live without having a private chef, you know, for longer than a couple oh, of weeks. Yeah. Uh, you know, what, I, what I've tried to do since uh, the story ran is stay on it, but just be a little less restrictive. So, you know, I think that, you know, occasionally you can have something good for dinner. Uh, I've been limiting myself in the morning, but still having one, one uh, coffee or one espresso and you know, I, I just think that, uh, you know, they're, they're all about, you know, moderation with all things. And so, you know, the moderation level for a sports writer, I think, would be different than the modern moderation level for, a, you know, NFL caliber starting quarterback. And so uh, <laughs> I take it as a matter of degree there, I think. <laughs> so, so we live in a copycat world in the world of sports. After seeing the results that Tom's had after doing this, why aren't more athletes in the country talking about it or doing it? You hear about folks go into these different training camps and working out with, you know, UFC fighters and stuff like that. You don't ever hear anybody talking about, hey, I tried the TB, you know, 12 method and, and you know, it's worked for Tom and I want it to be like me. Is it too difficult? Is it too restrictive? Or is it just something that they just don't believe in? You know, I think it's more that, like, teams have to kind of wrap their minds around it. You know, I asked Tom that directly, like, why why teams didn't take a more holistic approach to their training? You know, why they didn't have – why not every NFL team has, an, has a nutritionist on staff? Why doesn't every team, like, sort of look into some of this body work? And, you know, Tom said – Let me interrupt you right there. Uh, Did you sure. say that not every team has a nutritionist on staff? I thought that would have been a given. Uh, they, yeah, uh, not to the level I think that Brady does. And oh, so, okay. you know, like oh. just kind of more in- incorporating his whole approach. And so, you know, what he said is that uh, he found it similar to the debate on climate change and that, uh, you know, people, uh, you know, should at this point sort of know that something is, is wrong and instead of, uh, instead of, uh, you know, just going forward and fixing it, they, they end up, uh, you know, Instead of going forward and fixing it, they end up, uh, you know, kind of going with the status quo, keeping things the way they are. And so he says he sees a future in sports where there are a lot of athletes like him. You know, he's got a book coming out 
in September. And I think that he has sort of this idea that, you know, if, if he gives out sort of the method that he's been uh, using and other athletes can benefit from it, then they ultimately will. Gotcha. All right. Now, on, on day two, you move into brain games in the article. Uh, you said Brady cycles through 29 games that train attention, memory, brain speed, navigation, people skills, and intelligence. At, first off, now I expected memory, brain speed, navigation, intelligence, you know, all that. Those sound normal. But – People skills. What kind of game is out there to help Brady work on people skills on a computer? Well, I have to say that advertising may be a little bit off because uh, <laughs> after having done the brain games now for a month or so, I'm not sure I've improved my people skills at all. So, uh, you know, that that was part of how they, they sold it on the website, but I think my editors would tell you differently if, uh, if you talk to them about how I've been this week. All right. Now, you, Merson caught – is it Merson? Is that how you say his name? Yeah. Okay, yeah, so, David Merson, my my body coach. Sorry for saying that. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so you you call he called the brain games your coffee. Now, did the mind exercises actually do a good job of waking you up to to help spur you off of needing coffee in the morning? You know, so this is one of the things where I sort of felt like it could have been placebo, but you know, I have been doing them consistently, and sometimes I've been doing them before I write. I wouldn't say that it's similar to caffeine. But I would say that it definitely like increases your alertness a little bit. And I don't know whether that's just in my own brain. I've kind of tricked myself to think it's going to work or if it's really from the games themselves. So either way, uh, that's something I've stuck with, too, since the story ran. Now, it, is that something like can we access these brain games? Is it just something yeah, that, that you can go on Google? Yeah, it's called Brain HQ. Is like the group they partner with, and it, it costs a few dollars a month. But like, you can set yourself up so that you have regular training on there. They cycle through different games, and uh, you know, you're. I do uh, three for five minutes a day, so fifteen minutes total. Uh, pretty easy. Doesn't take a lot of time, and all you really need is your computer or your phone. I can get down wow. to that. And my brain needs all the training I can get. <laughs> <laughs> so, is it, is this whole thing just for athletes, or can anybody with money to burn? Because obviously, this is this is not something that's for the faint of heart or the wallet. Um, is this for anybody that could want to do this? Yeah, I think it's a matter of degree. You know, they they laid it out as sort of the way that they've been doing the training regimen. You know, getting them ready to play quarterback and win Super Bowls and all that kind of stuff, but. I think anybody can benefit from it. And I, I think the evidence is sort of just in, in the story that I wrote. Um, I don't know if I'll benefit from it as much as he does, but you know, the hardest thing is just the, the outlay of the cash. You know, none of this stuff is, uh, is very cheap. Even the electrolytes he sells on his, on his website are $15 just for a little bottle. And so, uh, it's definitely not cheap to live like Tom Brady and I'm not sure how sustainable it is, but, uh, if anybody that can afford it and wants to, I think would benefit from it. So my question to follow up on that is, do you think personally it's worth the money? That's interesting. That's an interesting call. You know, I, I say for me, it, in my experience, it was, you know, I, I was able to, wow. I had a fractured pinky toe that was what that was able to uh, run on. And by the end of it, um, I did a road race that was, uh, 200 miles uh, a couple weeks ago, right after I had come back Ooh. from TB12. Uh, I was responsible for 16 miles of that. I was going to say, I read that you were over 15 miles, miles of that. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, and so, like, you know, for me, the experience was worth it. Uh, being able to understand the approach better was worth it. Uh, I think people could benefit from it, and I think they could do a lot of it themselves. You know, I guess that would be the catch to all of it. Uh, you could, you know, follow the diet and get electrolytes at the store and, get similar protein bars that aren't his brand and do it for a lot less, uh, that's for sure. All right. Well, we'll close out on this. We don't want to keep it too long. We appreciate you coming on. But do you think – well, first, I have, did you actually get – have you met Tom? Have you done interviews with him over the phone, or you actually met him in person? You no, know, I've met him. Uh, I think I've done three magazine stories on him, so each time we would have done one interview. Uh, some have been over the phone and some have been in person. But um, he was not at TV 12 when I was there doing the work. Uh, that was mainly uh, his body coach and the one that I got as well. All right. Um, um, this is this is like the highlight of my life. I know a guy that personally met Tom. <laughs> this, is, this, is, this is the biggest thing in the world for me, so I appreciate it. Do you That's think, awesome. in your opinion, what do you, what do you think about Tom, his career, the process that he's taken. Um, do you think that sports in 10 years, 15 years, will eventually look back at him as like in the TV 12 method as revolutionary, or is this just another workout that is going to make its way through the cycle of, of sports? 
You know, I think he's made an impact on over, older athletes that will be remembered down the road. You know, that that I did a main story that that accompanied the piece of me living like him, uh, where I talked to other athletes about how he influenced them. That was Didier Drogba, Carlos Beltran, Daniel Cormier, uh, Delisha Milton Jones. You know, just a bunch of people that had excelled in sports when they were 38 or older, and they all sort of had a weird tie to Brady. Uh, Drogba was a soccer player, and they'd met at the at the Montreal Grand Prix. Uh, you know, uh, Cormier had like followed his press conferences, like mining them for tips. And there, there was just sort of, sort of a clear idea that like this has become a thing in all sports for a lot of athletes and that Brady's at the front and center of it. So, uh, I do think when we look back with some time in the, in the rear view that we'll look at it as something that was, you know, different than, uh, all these other workouts and something that made a real impact on sports. Good deal. I, again, he is Greg Bishop, senior writer at Sports Illustrated. You can follow him online at Greg Bishop SI. Greg, you've been outstanding. Thank you so much for taking the time to join us here on Winning Cures Everything. Thank you, sir. We appreciate it. Pre- appreciate you having me, uh, guys. Let me know if, uh, if you end up doing it. I'd be curious to see your progress. Absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. We can do that. <laughs> oh, man. Would, would he take, like, uh, we'll, we'll say a plus 300-pound average guy that, that just manages a, a flooring store? <laughs> I think that would prove it. That would prove. I think that would prove it as much as anything, right? You know, because oh, it's going to work for everybody. If yeah. I could be a spokesman for something, Tom sold. Oh Lord! <laughs> hey Greg, I got to get you to quit putting ideas in his head. <laughs> <laughs> All right, be good, buddy. We'll talk to you soon. Thanks for having me, guys. Hey, this is Gary Seegers, host of The Stage View. Make sure and tune in to Local X's first morning sports show, Winning Cures Everything, with myself and Chris Giannini every Tuesday and Friday at 9 a.m. Check out the site and grab the podcasts at winningcureseverything.com.